to run. Ah. Hey! What's doing? You gotta sit. You calm serious? your farm. What is, <laughs> hey, what is doing here? Get out. Jesus. This is out of control. Alright, guys, uh, welcome to week two with the crew. Uh, Locke and Paul in the house drinking some coffee. Um, we have double pooch day. The dogs are here. The dogs are in the house. So if you uh, ooh, 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 ooh. so if you hear any uh, swinging of doors, it's the dog doors going off. We're gonna leave it. It's an authentic, rustic feel. Guys, today we're gonna uh, we're gonna get into Lockie and I have a bit of conversation, um, and we're just gonna let you guys listen in on our thoughts and the the change in CrossFit the last ten years. Uh, that sort of marks where we're up to anyway in the in the CrossFit world, and also where we both started. Um, so yeah, hope you enjoy. We're just gonna have a bit of a chat, and uh, hopefully you guys take something away from it. What what would you say are some of the significant changes though in in the last ten years? Obviously finance. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's gone from like, you know, it's still a, it was always a higher end pay for a non return. You're literally going in for coaching for a different facility, and then the winnings. It's gone from a you know, a non-sport to a multi-multi-million dollar ESPN show, that's got to have changed something. Big time. You know? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Expectation of, you know, the the gym goers. People are just going out there to, to partake in fitness, want to get fitter. You know, it's it's evolved so much for them also, you know. Yeah, yeah. Just in the access, you know, to the facilities they have now, like most CrossFit gyms are, you know... Hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of equipment in these, you know, beautiful spaces. Whereas, you know, when it all was getting off the ground, it was literally dusty barbell in a backyard, or you know, take some kettlebells down to the oval and run up and down the hill a few times. And hundred percent, when I know. started, that's exactly what it was. Like yeah. there was no gym. No, there was a guy who you know had it, had all his equipment. Like Corey had all his equipment in his car. Yeah. We'd head to a, a park or a public space that we hadn't paid for. You know, we'd pay the coach for his materials and his gear. Um, if it was raining, we'd still turn up. You know, he's yeah. gone out in his car in the morning and marked a, a six hundred run in the morning from wherever we're training that day. Um, that was that was that was CrossFit, CrossFit yeah, on the coast, was, especially yeah. here, like where we are now yeah. on the coast. That that was it. You know, that was it. Um, and your expectation was nothing. Like that was you were like, this is awesome. Yeah. And I think that's something that unfortunately has definitely lost its way. You know, like when you and I paid. You know, twenty to thirty dollars to you know six years ago, it was just you weren't expecting anything than a great workout, a non globo facility, no toilets, no showers, just bare. Minimum it was the unknown, fitness. wasn't it? Yeah. yeah, it really was the unknown. It could just be sandbags and swimming. Yeah, you know, and it could it could have been. I remember one time we did a, a burpee, burpee on the sand, sandbag run, swim or wade if you were scared to swim. You could just wade out in the water, out to a cone, and then come back in. On that topic, quickly, do you remember your first workout or yeah, first CrossFit workout? Yeah, 100%. It was at Mingara. Yep. Where I first worked, and uh, we did a 7x3 strict press yep. to a 3RM, and then we did Kalsu, which was 100 thrusters for time every minute, oh, uh, five burpees, and I'd used a 30 kilo stagnant bar, so a bar that was completely. You couldn't, the, there was no bar, there was no weights on it, it was just a log. <laughs> um, we did it in a group fitness room, and I'm pretty sure I finished in about 15 minutes and I spewed in the Mingara disabled toilet. There was about 13 of us just howling on the floor. And I'm pretty sure even then we paid the coach five bucks just to do that. And it wasn't part of that, that gym, that facility. It was just underground, like full. Do you remember, like, what was... Yeah, yeah, I do. I was uh, in the group fitness room upstairs at 4-in-1 <laughs> Fitness of Wyoming, which is now Anytime <laughs> Fitness, um, with a couple of local guys from here. And... It was a 30 kilo thruster. So with a pump bar, with a body pump bar for you people that know Les Mills. And one of those body step stair, you know, oh. stair stacks. So every time you jump up for a box jump. Rocks like. Oh mate, it was all over the place. Seahawks. And it was just 21, 15, 9 thrusters with that, you know, box dodgy jump. bar and box jump with the shaky step. And, you know. I don't know if there was another movement in there or not, but I just remember those two and just thinking this is the hardest thing I've ever done in my lifetime. And yeah, that and was it. 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 was it was born in you know this little you know a little area upstairs on the carpeted 
you know, group fitness stage. So. Some of those, some like for me, that's one of the, I'm talking about evolution of fitness <clears throat> and CrossFit. For me, I'm still, those two workouts that were just speak, spoken about are still classic. Oh. They're something I'd happily program. So, so memorable. And, and it's, it's unfortunate that the evolution of CrossFit, you know, because it is a strength conditioning protocol, people, you know, essentially steer away from the, the random or varied CrossFit. But that stuff is, that is the goal. Like yeah. that is the... And that's why it was successful for, you know... That's right. For special forces or for, you know, defense forces or for, yeah. you know, public servants, you know, fireys and, you know, because it was the unknown and... Yeah, 100%. Yeah. It didn't matter. It was just like, get in, get it done. Yeah. You know, this could this task could be asked of you. Grab a heavy sandbag and get walk it done. 500 meters, then yeah. drop it down, do 50 burpees. Yeah, that's don't it. question it. No. Don't ask don't, to change it. Don't Google it and find a different one. And... Yeah. Like, it was just like, that's on the board, you do it. Yeah, and which for me was really appealing. I really enjoyed that part of it where it was, you know, we had this saying, like Trent and I, who's at BTS, and it was like, if it's on the board, you can't change it. Or if it's written down on a piece of paper, you it's can't done. change it. You, you can't, can't change it. it. And it's like, on the board, yeah, it's done. We you can't that change now, it. And like, you know, and it's kind of when you find yourself in the middle of it, you're like, oh, that's maybe that's too much. It was like, you know, at, at the start, you thought it was a good idea. Just yeah, get yeah, it done. Yeah. And yeah, see, that's so, so, it's so, it's so funny how it's changed, evolved. And some of it's great. Like, don't get me wrong. Not, not, not the, all the evolution is poor, but no. those basic, some of those basic needs have changed so significantly from people's necessity to have just little things, comforts. Yep. You know, you used to come in to get uncomfortable. You used to come across it because it was dirty. It was dark. Nobody knew what you were doing. No. You, know, you had this barbell. You it was underground. Thrusters. It was Wasn't underground, it? you know? But yeah. now it's like, hey, I just wanted to come and try CrossFit. I've been doing it here. Uh, do you guys have uh, saunas, a uh, shower, <laughs> as, you know, a float tank? Just those crazy. air conditioning, yeah. you know? And it's like, you, you, I understand that with the evolution, we have to meet some of those criteria. That is sure. 100%. And I agree with those, you know, like the, the, the adoption of little creature comforts obviously increases your, your base yeah, of likability and you know yeah, yeah, yeah your base of you know human needs yeah someone wants to have a shower for they go to work you provide that necessity yeah. um but there is also that softness that's come where it's like if i don't have those things i'm not going to choose that facility to train at yeah and that's that's a real negative because you, you're missing out on such great fitness such great community you know, that was the emphasis of why we started something different, why we joined. I mean, that's why ultimately you're looking, when you email, why are you looking for a different facility? Why are you looking for a different method of training? What's wrong with the method that you're doing? Is it stale? Yeah. You know? What about evolution of coaching for you? So when you started, mm. not to uh, have a negative impact or to <clears throat> talk poorly about when we started, but were you significantly coached? Were you coach the way you coach now? No, not at all. No. Um, obviously, for the the experience I had at that age, I'd probably been PT for three ish years, four years. So, in a life cycle of a personal trainer, essentially, or a group fitness instructor, you know, still considered fairly experienced. You know, having three or yeah, four 100%. years, even though in a lifetime, you know, as a career, I would say we are both career fitness instructors, personal trainers, coaches, whatever the, the title may be, you know, exceeding 10 years now. Um, whereas at that time, I felt well educated and, you know, knowledgeable and, you know, I always paid close attention to the detail of the movements, but it comes with anything that you do for a longer period of time, like the, the service or the skill set you have now to deliver a higher level of, you know, of coaching is definitely far different from when I started for sure. And I think the methodology of, uh, the learning process for coaches too has has evolved and changed, which has been fantastic for for CrossFit because it used to be they go down, get your certificate, and you know essentially spread the movement, which was cool, and that's yes. it allowed it to grow and it gave access to you know to the movement for people like you and I. But we'd already had you know the strength and conditioning background and you know university and you know personal training certificates, so yeah, it's it's evolved a lot now. You know, it's, it's a lot more structured. You know, and I think, you know, for you and I, it's we're at a different place now than when we started it, for sure. Has the value, do you think, increased subsequent to the coaching? In terms of... When you, when I, when we started, yep. what we would pay as an affiliate, what you would pay as a member of the gym, yep. has it increased parallel with the coaching? No. 
No, I think the services that are offered now in, I guess, if you were to, you know, correlate it to monetary value in terms of your dollar, you obviously get a lot more now, which is the way society is moving, right? Like, 100%. You know, people go for breakfast now and they want, you know, beautiful, delicious pool pulled pork, pulled pork tacos and a coffee for $12. But it's like, realistically, that's... It has to look good. Yeah. You know, it has to be delicious. It has like, to be quick. Yeah, totally. Yeah. But I want it now. For 12 bucks. Yeah. So... Yeah. It's the same with fitness, right? Like, so whatever, you know, the weekly rate is, it's kind of like now as a consumer, it's fantastic to be in the market as, you know, someone partaking in it because obviously, you know, to stay competitive, you have to offer more and you have to have better services. And, you know, luckily for us, we have a lot of you know knowledge and skill to, to give to our members. So I'm just asking the question because yeah. I don't think we're undervalued monetary no. wise no not at all all I think is that now there is a closer correlation between why you are paying the money and what you're getting for sure that's what I think yeah I believe that when we were paying that money it was highly highly to create elitism of yeah a style of fitness for sure oh you pay X amount let's say 50 bucks a week or you pay X amount you must be doing something phenomenal you know to pay that money and it's like well you know I was doing something that I thought at the time, yeah. like you, three years in or two years in of, of PTing. I was like, well, this is new. Yeah. And to be exposed to this, I'm willing to pay. Yeah. And I still think that's a value. No, absolutely. It gave us this yeah. opportunity. But I also think that when Glassman designed this program, he was giving that value. Yeah. He was educating. You know, he's still educating now. He's, you know, he's always on... He's always on suing Coca-Cola or at least trying to get into the diabetes world. Or, you know, I think he's still educating and I think that that is what it was always about. And, and to create that movement, like you said, and, and we all had to buy in and spend the thousand bucks and become a level one coach, which they still do. And it's not even, I don't think it's increased that much. Um, did create a cult, you know, a community of, of cult leaders of this oh, underground fitness and it was cool and now it's just a part of something a PT will go and do. Mm-hmm. So you could you could run a, a gym and then just go get your CrossFit course, course um, certificate just so you can run that style of fitness. And it's no longer you're going down. Generally, when I was there, everyone who was there had the intention to open one of these underground facilities, you know, and yeah. smash out a bunch of thrusters and muscle ups for people and Franz and Isabels. So I think it's I, I'm with you. I think it's the, as a consumer, they are now paying for what they deserve. Yeah. They should know how to. They should be taught the basic fundamentals of like, hey, this is a broomstick snatch, here's a barbell snatch, there's a, you know, 35, 95, and that sort of stuff. So I agree. I think that the evolution has finally come to fruition of we want to evolve you as a human being athletically. We don't want to just get you to pay heaps of money so they don't have to train a global facility. So you can train, you can throw the cohort shirt on and say, I train somewhere different. Yeah. You know, I train somewhere, everyone trains somewhere different. Yeah. What's your thoughts Big one, a big topic of discussion at the moment in podcasts going around the affiliation. The three thousand, I think it's nearly four grand for us cohort to maintain the name CrossFit. What is your thoughts on the affiliation with CrossFit as HQ as our brand? What's your thoughts versus, let's say, for instance, if we were cohort or if we're cohort CrossFit? I th- yeah, I think I still and you would agree still see the value in being associated with CrossFit. That is obviously our beginnings, and if it were to not be associated with CrossFit, it wouldn't necessarily change what happens in our walls. But I think it would just, you know, it would lose why we started this in the fir- first place. I would, I would think, oh, yeah. you know, I, I, I don't so know. So, as, as an intrinsic value, you think? Yeah, yeah. I think you know, as a you know, for the business culture and stuff like that, being associated with CrossFit, you know, is why we started, right? You know, 100%. Why you started, why I started, because um, that's our movement. Um, obviously, you know, locally and internationally, you know, a lot of people have strayed away from being associated with CrossFit to save the extra dollars. I can understand their reasoning behind it. I'm not sure if it's the right or the wrong way to go about it. I think though that, um, as a part of CrossFit, it would be nice if you've been affiliated for five years or for four years or something like that, there might be a kickback from CrossFit to say, thank you. Thank you, Cohort CrossFit, for being with us as a you know a favourable you know customer. You know we want to try and help you now as a small fitness facility to really continue this and yeah, be with us for ten idea. years. I think that would be a great idea. Um, so sort of like a community give back. Totally. Like yeah, you go get you know? a coffee card stamped ten times, you get 100%. a free coffee. Yeah. 
you know, we pay, or well, you pay the, <laughs> the, the, the dollars every year, you know, and when I was in Canada, it was the same thing that every affiliate pays their affiliate fee annually to be associated with the name CrossFit. And I see value in that. Um, but I think also to HQ for people that are, you know, honorable and, you know, consistent with the branding and the way they deliver their programming, I think it would be nice just to have, you know, have something in there which allows you to continue that faith in the branding and to promote the good word. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's a great yeah. way to look at it. It's hard, obviously, as an affiliate owner, affiliate owner, you see the local affiliates dropping off. Yep. I mean, we had, I'm going to say we had maybe 10 at this side of Newcastle. Yeah, I'm going to say. I mean, in the last, it blew up here. Like, it went. We went crazy. It went crazy. It was like a... Well, it's like the barber stores now, right? Oh, Every other yes. corner, there's a barber shop. Yes. No? Yes. And that was CrossFit three years ago, I reckon. Mm. Three, four years ago? Four years ago, maybe. Mm. Probably five, four, five years five ago. Five years ago, yeah. In, on the Central Coast. Yep. And it was like, that was it. It was like anyone could go, it was it was just pop ups, pop ups, pop ups everywhere, you know? I think that's died down a lot. Um, and for us, it's great because we've stayed true to the cause and, you know, we've become one of the, the premier names on the coast here, which is great because not. Everybody here is still still doing it. So, and I think you have to deliver a why. Like I think as yeah. any any business, you have to have a solid why. Why are we doing what we're doing? As as a car salesman, it doesn't as a barber. And I think that just saying I'm going to drop the affiliation because I don't agree with X, Y, and Z. I don't agree with. Let, let's take some examples. I don't agree with the affiliation cost four thousand dollars. I don't agree with giving guns to the winners of the CrossFit Games. I don't agree with suing a huge conglomerate for providing a sugary drink to customers consumers. Because I They're like f- Diet Coke. For instance, right? <laughs> like, I don't agree with those three things. Mm-hmm. But if I own an Apple Mac store, I don't necessarily, necessarily love the new iPhone 8, but I'm still delivering a quality product that I believe in. And like you said, I think there's a there's got to be something deeper in why you're doing what you're doing. And you said there's an intrinsic value in being associated with CrossFit. Now, there's there's way more than just intangibles involved with being with them. I mean, I think there's a from 2012, a CrossFit affiliate was being sued in New Zealand. I think it was in Queenstown or Christchurch, or and Glassman flew down to the affiliate and fought that hand in hand so he was holding the affiliate's owner's hand and he's like let's do this yeah. you know and I'm pretty sure again it was like a bicep tendon tear or something that could happen play football or you know um, so I think there's is intangibles like you and I have this payback scenario of hey you've given me an opportunity in life that without CrossFit I might have been a trainer for five years and then I might be back to chefing or I might be opening a store this week yeah. uh, and I feel that those intangibles are highly valued for guys like you and I for sure. and then I feel like the tangible things are those supports. Hey, if I've got a problem with my affiliate, I can at least ring affiliate support and say, hey, this is what's happening. Can you guys give me a helping hand? And if you're willing to ask for that help, I'm sure you will receive that feedback. You also have this, you know, 20 deep law firms that are sort of working ins and outs of, you know, the CrossFit Level 1 seminar and, you know, people are always trying to come at CrossFit because it's something different, like UFC when it started, you know, trying to sue them or trying to get at them because they're different or... Also, people stealing their identity, like F45 coming in with this hit, in, hit interval training and those guys trying to combat that. So I think there's a bunch of tangibles that come with being associated with something great. And I feel to say that, oh, I don't want to pay a $4,000 affiliation fee and I'll be stronger as a brand. This is my brand. And I don't agree with giving out guns. Well, no, I don't agree with that either. We live in Australia. We don't have guns here. You know, like it's not something we would hand out to our members. But if that's something deep rooted in their culture that they want to do, and CrossFit feels the necessity to do that, I'm not going to kick up, kick up a stink. Just like if we decide to hang, hand out something that was culturally a part of what we're doing, yeah. that's fine. I'm not saying it's a great idea. I wouldn't do it. But there's so many tangibles and intangibles associated with a great brand that I don't feel that four thousand dollars is an excessive amount to pay, or whatever it is. Let's yeah. say they make it ten, yeah. ten thousand dollars. It's like okay, well, how much do you value our brand? How much does CrossFit bring people in your door? And that's the argument is people are saying, you know, we listen to these podcasts and you and I work with other gym gym instructors and they're doing everything we're doing. You know, we went to Fitness First last week and on the board there's the three challenges and yeah. they're AMRAPs and they're EMOMs and they're, people were always doing these things, but the lingo, that's the guys, the guys who are using it, they're specifically using CrossFit language. Yeah. 
And we don't go in there and kick up a stink and, you know, hey, man, can I see the manager, please? I just wanted to make sure that you guys knew, you know. Yeah, you know that is an affiliation right. cost. Like, I pay $4,000 a year and you guys are multi-millionaires. Yeah. You know, stealing, essentially, the stuff that you hate, that you're suing for. It's, there's, there's so many great things that come with our brand, the CrossFit brand. And I don't think it's just... I'm going to sign this off and no longer do this because my members already know I'm great. My members already value my community service, the way I treat them, the way Lockie's amazing personality and so provides quality coaching and Ollie helps out. I don't think that that's an honorable way to finish an affiliation. Like, okay, everyone knows us. We're killing it. Let's cut the $4,000 and burn that bridge. Use our names to, to benefit. That's just my thought. Yeah, I would agree with that. And that's, you know, the reason why you still have the name CrossFit is because you understand the value and you, you know, you know where you came from and you know where you're going. I remember like, it, you know, people are sort of, you know, weird about this, but I remember when I met Glassman, you know, and I was just, the only thing I could say to him, I had about 15 margaritas in me. I was watching the games in California. God bless California. I wish it was still there. Love California. Come back to California games. And uh, I met Glassman. I was, you know, 15 margaritas deep, had my shirt off. I the, love you. The, <laughs> and um, no, I just, I just said to him, I, he said, where are you from? And at the time I was coaching at Active and I said, I'm coaching at Active. You know, Chad was competing. And I just said, I just want to thank you because you, you, know, you saved my life, changed my life. You know, like I was a chef. I'm a chef by trade. So to have this opportunity to give back, it's got to be intrinsic. Some of that's got to be in oh, you. Sure. You've got to be a good person. You lit your fire. You yeah. Know? It you changed know? you. You, know? I might, you, well, you and I might do that for someone now. Yeah. And they might, thank you in, in 10 years from now. I just want to thank Locke for getting me started on my journey. And that's kind of the affiliation fee in its intrinsic value and it's non-tangible is honorable, respectful. This is how it's done. I know not all businesses like that, but these are small businesses. If you want to challenge it, really, you've got to be something like a 45. If cohort just leaves their brand tomorrow and opens 15 more cohorts that don't mean any, no CrossFit, just cohorts, there's nothing, there's nothing for that. There's no need for that, just using our own ego and our own coaching ability and our own brand and ethos. It's all adapted from things we've learned. And everyone who's arguing anything different, I think is lying to themselves. Everything that we know and that we coach and that we teach is an amalgamation of a melting pot of greater people. That's the thing. It's all been done before. Oh. Everything's been done before, you know? That is, that is just, kind of your point of difference. Totally. Like having the name is kind of the point of difference. Yeah. Mate, that sushi and banana bread is killing me. Stacked. You can't eat again. <laughs> Let's talk about how has CrossFit and nutrition specifically changed in the last 10 years, do you think? So, well, yeah, just, just aligning the nutritional side of CrossFit. Well, I think when you and I, well, from my experience, first of all, it's changed massively. Yep. Um, and I think, again, it's not a negative or a positive, but I think it's almost correlative to why people come in. So, you know, when you and I were going in, it was just literally to try something different and we were exposed to a different thing. And I think that nutrition was the same. You'd come in and people were like, you know, for instance, if you joined a CrossFit community, we won't say gym because they weren't around, but, you know, carbs are the devil. Um, at the time, I think, I feel that you were either on the paleo wagon to start and if not the zone or maybe like you came in, paleo was the foundation for a couple of maybe six to 12 months. And then once you'd got that under wraps, you'd move into a zone, deep, deeper zone. Um, I don't know if that's because Rob Wolf was punched out after 12 months for his disagreeing. I don't know if that helps with bringing back Barry Sears in for the zone. He became yeah. part of it. So, um, Rob was part of the CrossFit HQ staff and then obviously dismantling, um, some nutrition barriers, got him kicked out and having a disagreement, which is fine, private business. Um, and then, you know, the zone was always there as well with, with Dr. Barry Sears and, and that coming in. But I'd have to say ultimately... The carb phobia um, was brought on hand in hand with the explosion of functional movement of CrossFit, I think. Uh, that's that's my thoughts. Do you think that's similar? Or... Yeah, I would agree. I remember starting and uh, during CrossFit Level 1, they would teach shotgun. 
<laughs> Sorry, guys, that was just a ghost. Um, I remember them, uh, you know, educating briefly. There was a, uh, the zone, the zone eating style, you yep. know, so blocks and whatnot. That was kind of touched briefly on in CrossFit Level 1 when I did it. And I remember adopting that pretty much immediately after I did uh, <laughs> the next level day. one. Yeah. Pretty much, yeah. And essentially, at a, at, a, at a glance, it was, you know, for what who I was and the weight I was and all that sort of, the age I was at, it was, I was allowed essentially per meal, it's like 180 to 200 grams of turkey breast, you know, or cured meat, whatever it may be. Protein. Yeah, that's my protein. The fats I consumed was, in each meal was like, you know, eight to 12 almonds or six macadamia nuts. Yeah, 25 grams. Or, yeah. yeah. So all kind of lower values and carbs per meal it was essentially an apple or one and a half apples mm, that was 100%. like one and a half i remember totally yeah, yeah. That, and that was yeah. that was me hitting three or four blocks in my zone and yeah it's, it's evolved hugely now where i mean i still agree their their ethos i had on my last gym's wall and i still agree with that eat meat right, seeds nuts and veg low fruit high starch 100%. consume and consume food that will hold your energy levels for fitness and exercise but not excess body fat. Yep. And I feel that that is still relevant now. Totally. I feel that is a great method. If not, it's more relevant now than ever. And and the fact it mentions to sustain good exercise allows for variance because what you do for exercise and what a marathon runner does for exercise yep. has resulted in how you both look and how you both eat. So I still massively uphold that. I still think that I could have that on my... If I could do it again, took me a couple of hours, I'd do it again. Yep. Um, I feel that as the sports evolved, the needs for smart nutrition have evolved higher and at a faster rate than us partaking in it. Yep. And uh, just coming in there, yep. I think that heavily revolves around the fact that it's gone from being an amateur backyard pastime to a high level extreme, extreme sport. sport. And that's exactly why the nutritional side for the elite athlete has evolved and changed so much as a backyard fitness enthusiast, the, you know, the veg, all that stuff is going to work perfectly and it's going to sustain them as said, don't want to, you know, consume too much where it, you know, promotes, you know, a a caloric surplus of, you know, calories. And now, you know, for a, an elite athlete of the 2018 games, it's going to be completely different because yeah. they wouldn't get through their first morning workout if they were restrictive I, per se. And I think even just in, as a gym, like the evolution of nutrition in the gym, the metabolic demand of someone who's doing, let's say, our advanced program, which is running you know five days a week at high intensity, there's a mental part that's not accounted for that we never used to account for, metabolic demands of the mental pressure of those types of things. Um, and anyone who's been doing this sport 10 years will happily admit that there is a mental side to this sport that is metabolically demanding. Yeah, yeah. There's obviously the physical of the actual in time, here's my 20 minutes of work, here's my hour of 10 of work. Then there's the out of time, need to recover. And then there's the part in between where I need to live my life, uh, have good conversations, yeah. interact with other human beings, talk to my family, lift my kids up, not just the elite level I'm supporting food and nutrition for the metabolic demands of my exercise, and that is it. Yeah. I go home. I'm a dead man. You know, I'm not. I'm not doing enough. I'm not interactive. I'm not engaging. I'm not excited. I'm not motivated. I can't have one of these conversations because I'll be fucked after. You yeah. know, because yeah. um, you're exhausted. You don't have the energy to part partake in all of these extra demands and in I your f- social structure. Yeah. And I feel like the that we both agree that the people who started, and even the people who are at the top now, like if we look at that's like Cara Webb, she's been doing CrossFit long time and she's openly said the last two years has, has worked out in nutrition been working against gravity and one of the biggest things was obviously increasing the carbohydrate intake and that's not against her because she increased with the sport right like she went on that linear progression of starting fitness for the sake of fitness and, and going with her coach and obviously that's changed now but came out of a globo facility as a at doing PT with a coach and he was going to go open a gym he was like hey I'm going to go open this CrossFit gym come with me walks with her you know Brian and, um, you know, at that time, eat meat, seeds, nuts and veg, we were all doing it, yeah. or paleo, whichever way you were going. I was heavily paleo. I think I ate bread for the first time in seven years when I went to New Zealand a couple of years back, you know. I had extreme fear, fear of food. Um, 
and I feel like you can see that the reason they're all asking for this help, and we're all we're all witnessing it. Like a lot of people are really diving so much deeper now at the top end into the nutrition. Yeah. You know? Because it's so important for performance. You know? It's the most important piece. Yeah, absolutely. Now. I mean, yeah. they've done double unders for 15 years. Yeah. You know, or 10 years, some of them now. Yeah. You know, you and I have been doing kipping pull-ups for 10 years. What can I do in my sleep, in my food, yeah. to help that? Um, and I, I feel that it's nice that it's being attacked. Yeah. I, I feel it's nice that it's becoming people are becoming more self-educated. Of course, you have the, like you said, when you came to the gym, you did what was on the board, you did what the coach told you. Now there's these things where people will, oh, why are we doing this? Why are we doing that? Yeah. You know, that never used to happen. You never, and this is the same with the food, right? Yeah. Hey, this is what I want you to do. And now people are like, oh, I heard this podcast from such and such or, you know, Joe Rogan or Paulie and Locke and they were saying, you know, I'm not eating enough of this and that. And it's, it's good because people are educating themselves and they're getting a better understanding of food. And you can't agree with everything that everyone's thinking, and that's great. Like, I'm, I'm, me and you obviously eat differently. I'm 77 kilos and you're 103, you know. Yeah. Um, but I think in terms of how it started to how it finished, it's done a 180. I think that people who were good at CrossFit back then were on the paleo wagon and lean as hell and, and kind of looked, you know, emaciated. And now it, it, we've all seen them. Yeah. Like, they are... You know, eating 100 to 150 grams of carbs per meal. Yeah. They look jacked. They look right energetic. before a workout, oh. immediately after, like the windows, the metabolic windows, they, you know, the importance of eating food, you know, immediately, you know, before or after or during, you know, if they're doing long workouts. Oh, 100 grams of carbs per totally. workout. It's amazing. We, um, we did, we, leading up to the open with Soph, I sat down with Dax from Next Gen and we had looked at essentially just post-workout. Yeah. So within a five minute window of exercise and, we, I'd always wanted to add more, more and more, more carb into that position, into that window, um, from essentially nothing, fear phobia, phobia of carbs, you know, like the rest of us. And it was instant result. Like we got instant change athletically. Um, and I'm not saying that's for everyone, but it's amazing that when you and I were doing it, the difference in dropping a hundred grams of carbs into a post workout, tra- you know, training session. Yeah. I actually think there was a stage when I was, when I was first starting, you know, nine or ten. I did, I literally would have no food for two hours post workout. Yeah, two hours, and I might have done like a fifteen minute run for hundred burpee box jump back then. Mostly was what yeah. I was doing, you know, that CrossFit endurance style yeah. stuff, and that's completely different now. Yeah. So I guess on that same topic, you could probably even. Um, as one of my coaches leading through the last year or two since I was down at NSWIS, the Institute of Sport for New South, New South Wales, the dietitian who I was working with there, how she completely transformed my eating habits in this you know, last cycle of training for me, which was completely different. Like I would rock up to train and have honey sandwiches on bread and then train hard and then crush another couple of honey sandwiches, just getting that, you know, 50 to 150 grams of carbohydrates before and after. Like those are things that I never ever would have thought of or wanted to do eight, 10 years ago. You know, from a fear of, oh, I can't, I can't have two sandwiches. You know, I can't do, I can't eat that much carbs right mm-hmm. now, you know, but it's amazing how, how the evolution of, you know, it's in athletics too. How especially, it's evolved. especially yeah. I was going to say performance. for performance. Yeah. yeah. Through education of food, people will be less fearing of foods and realizing I can eat most of what I eat if I do it correctly. And I think that that wasn't educated to us as much. And on that point, that's what I'm most excited about, you know, the evolution and, you know, how CrossFit has evolved over the last 10 years is that, Uh, you know, everyone's becoming more informed, you know, of the training methodologies, of the nutritional advice, and it just makes it a more complete program. It's fantastic because people are now educated on, why they're eating when they are and why they're not eating when they are, you know. And, and I think that all that does is, you know, that knowledge is just eliminates that fear. I mean, yeah. doing was ex- uh, removing foods without actually getting an idea of why. It was just like, these are the banned foods, don't eat these, yeah. these are the bad. I mean, even in the zone, when you do it, there's a good food group, yeah. a moderate and a bad food group. <laughs> yeah, totally. You know, and that is not the right way to teach people that. We're just saying that information and knowledge is the key here in in all of this and Absolutely. as the brand is getting bigger as too is the people influencing the brand because you've got people earning 275k from a sport so they're going to pay someone 
at the top, top end of nutrition in the most recent times of fitness yeah. to help them with their nutrition. So that then filters down into us, which then we get to give to the broader community and we have access to those those elite level nutritionists for performance that's filtering down the whys and hows and it doesn't necessarily mean it's for everyone but you have a broader knowledge and you have people in the gym unfortunately who don't have any idea and you also have people who come in who are looking for a bit of weight loss and we've been there and we have people who are coming in who are lean as covered in abs already who want to go to the games i lost 30 kilos before i started crossfit you know i'm scared of carbs anyway i was running 20 k's a week you know and <laughs> running so, away from them. <laughs> <laughs> and and so you know, that education is gold. I mean, that's how I spent the first six years of my, I was glued to Rob Wolf, you know, and that's how I, I think it's a massive reason of why our gym has got those results and why we get those nutrition programs. We get people lean in 12 weeks or less, six weeks. You know, we're doing a 40 day one and I expect great results. And it's not because my knowledge surpasses the other person's, it's because of the, the ability to impart that knowledge when there are people at the top filtering that through We've got a broader community to practice these fitness methods on. We've got these broader to practice these nutrition methods on. And that is something that as a gym instructor that you and I have done at, say, a Globo facility or a corporate world, it's not as easily accessible to practice these things on people to N equals one. Hey, I want you to do the go mad diet and eat, drink four liters of milk a day yeah. to put on weight. Remember that? You know, yeah, that was, oh, absolutely. Yeah. That was a thing. It's the best way to bulk, drink four liters four of milk a day. You know, instead of just giving proper nutrition or <laughs> yeah. sleep advice or, you know, and that's, that's still, there's probably someone practicing that as we speak, you yeah. know, or I still might give that to a 16 year old boy who's absolutely emaciated and doing six different training sessions a week and trying to make it at the top of football. But it's just that, like you said, that education and it's a great evolution of CrossFit that we are talking about this. Mm. And if we were teaching Les Mills still, I don't know if we would. Yeah, live, <laughs> live, live to air. Live on the cohort cast, J-Mac. How can we help you, mate? What can we help you with? Uh, all right, well, we're going to talk serious. We're talking like sports nutrition, are we? Sports <laughs> sports. <laughs> oh, mate, you must have ears in the walls because we just we just, just finished talking about the evolution of uh, nutrition in, in CrossFit. There's enough podcasts out there fluffing about talking about sweet potato and boiled chicken. That shit ain't gonna get you to regionals. What, what's gonna? What's what's the real stuff, mate? What's, what's, gonna, what's gonna get you? You're not educated, us, mate. What are we talking here? Well, we're, we're, we're talking the proper stuff, mate. I'm not an elite athlete. That's why I'm coming to ask you guys. You guys are in the know. I'm not. Mate, you're educating us as we speak. My ears are burning. Oh well, I'm gonna guess. Well. Uh, Oh, look, mate, like you probably competed against half of them only a couple of months ago. So yeah, yeah that, that, that is true. Those boys aren't sitting at 120 kegs at 6% body fat on our sweet potato and broccoli. Are you alluding to illicit substances in sport? Oh, oh, sorry, sorry about that disruption. We had, a, we had a live phone call from one of our listeners, old James McDonald, yeah. a.k.a. The, bat, the Battler from uh, Double Regionals show. Fancy getting a Double Regionals caller in. A Double Regionals athlete. Teams, I believe. I believe it was yeah. teams, if you want to bring it up. Unbelievable. James McDonald. Um, Born and raised in 2261. 2261. Now he's just crushing the... Uh, I think he's Newcastle Techie Guru, I think they're calling I him think, now. I think, yeah, the new, Newy Techie. Newy Techie Co. He's yeah. killing it, that guy. Yeah. We'll have to get him on next week, eh? Yeah, we will. We'll try yeah. to get him a live performance for you guys. Um, get some of his expertise in the, in the CrossFit world. I mean, he's, he's obviously been there. So, what about the evolution of... Of technology and crossfit. Well, because when the first time you did friend, you didn't know what your heart rate was. Really? Now, now, yeah, I don't. But now, when you do friend, you could you got to stop halfway through and check your Garmin, and and see if your heart rate's at five hundred or did not. You say Garmin. Gar- we are advertising Garmin today. For us, we're really, really oh. ancient. We still use the whiteboard. Yep. Take people's names. Write down their scores. Take a photo if you want. Like it's it's phenomenal how that's changed. Like for both general population and for the elite gym owner. athlete and the gym owner. gym owner, yeah. If you don't have some app with two TVs running, where they LCD sign in, screen, they sign in yeah. and the what app comes up and they Amazing. you're not a successful gym. Like you got to do the, you got to evolve with the times. But yeah. I mean, my thought is it's great. Some of it's great. Like they can map, yeah, some of them are track, tracking their bloods regularly and tracking their. That's great for a health perspective. Some of us just living in community. Like for me, that's why cohort keeps the whiteboard. That's yeah. why we do the whiteboard. 
get people's names, make them introduce, hey guys, this is Jimmy, it's his first class today. Totally. Those little basic things done really well are still the crux of a great community. Totally. I mean, you can't go to a community, any community, and not be involved and not be introduced and not be on the board. You've got to be on the board. Yeah. Um, I think that's a huge part of CrossFit. But yeah, in terms of the athletic thing, those, I mean, the Garmin's literally have a CrossFit, have CrossFit written in Yeah, them. it's amazing. Is that crazy? Oh, it's amazing. You, you, get, you know, you could get an instant read out of your blood glucose level, you know, like take your finger yeah, prick. Yeah, finger prick. You know, see where you're at after doing rowing intervals or it's phenomenal. Max power output on a force plate or... What's interesting is that Matt Fraser is still dominating yeah. and literally training out of his garage. Yeah, lift heavy. You know, trained at high intensity. Stuff that doesn't need to be measured. It's just like, can I go harder today? Yes, I can. Do I feel Do like it. resting today? Okay, I have to rest. Yes, totally. I love it, eh? It's amazing. Best in the league. Dominant. 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 Is T a dominant? 100%. Oos. Wow. I'm very... behind. Yeah, absolutely. Twice, second, first. Podium threes in a row. It's, in, it's insane. That's phenomenal. Podium once is insane. Let alone going back to back runner up, then being number one. Let's talk about the evolution of the female versus male CrossFit competitor. Who the hell is watching the boys anymore? Not me. It's amazing, <laughs> eh? Yeah. The, the, Two men more interested in the female and, yeah. and on a, as a whole, yeah. not just because it's Tia, totally. not just because it's Cara or no. Sarah. Or, it's like the competition is so fierce and the adaption, the way they've adapted to the oh. fitness. You know, from where it began, obviously the spectacle of the men's competition for me was superior, and I say that with respect to the women and what they were doing 100%. at the time. Um, now. Their, their specific evolution in their performance and the parameters of what they can do now has me amazed. Hands down, it is enjoyable to watch them to see what they are capable of doing. Obviously, the men are, are freaks, but watching the women do what they do now. Are they comparatively better athlete? Great question. I, I would go so far to say yes. Apples to apples, yeah. 100%. Yeah. The men, the men have always been good, for sure. Always been solid. There's always been an outlier. You know, Rich Fronin, then Fraser came along. It's feel, Fraser. The women, it's... I feel like you're watching five Matt Frasers. Yep. When you watch the girls, you're watching five yep. Matt Frasers. Yeah, five dominant, dominant females. fierce women. All of them could win. Depend, and, really depend on what the workouts come out. And I see, I think that that's taken, like when you watch this, the behind the scenes and you watch the update shows... It's taken the other way. It's like taken for granted. Like, oh, it's a lower standard, so they're all in the same league. Yep. It's like, no, no, no. You're watching dominant performances yep. of the top 10 females year round. The top 10 females are dominant year round. Yep. And I think the sport has evolved. This is where I think the most significant change has happened in CrossFit. The sport has got to a point where it's rewarding the right people. Yep. So with any sport, eventually the sport chooses the athlete not the other way around. Yep. And I feel like because it's been that decade, the sport is now choosing a certain body type, a certain person, with obviously outliers, like any sport, like Usain Bolt is an outlier in a 100-meter yes. sprint. But overall, the sport is now choosing and rewarding the athletes who are in the correct sport. Yep. And the ones who aren't are either falling back, and we're watching that happen, and what we're seeing is a bunch of women who have chosen the sport that has chosen them. And it's coming together to a fierce, fierce bat. Next level. Like girls snatching 100 kilos in 10 years. In 10 years. Imagine 10 years from now. That's 10 years. It's gone from girls struggling. I remember, do you... I remember the guys struggling to snatch 70 60, kilos. 65. 65 at the ranch. The first CrossFit Games. It's like doing, it, was, it was like it was a muscle snatch kind of overhead squatty thing. It wasn't even a snatch. I want to see it stick to that. I want to see the evolution stick to the parameters that we're given. I don't want to have to watch people scale the rope or I want them to see the evolution of what's possible. I still want the element of the unknown. I still want the sandbag. I still want the sledgehammer. I still want those pieces. But I want the evolution to continue through the strength parameters, the lifting parameters, the gymnastics parameters without having to make it silly, without having to go to ring handstand push-ups yeah. to evolve to... That's not evolution. It's, you know... Um, like randomness I don't yeah. want random bullshit movements but I want to see someone hang on to 50 ring muscle ups yeah. 
And of course, right now that is unheard of. It's like that is it's people would laugh at that listening to this. Yeah. But in ten years from now, who knows? Probably five. Because if I was to say, if we would have this same, you heard problems, it here first. Five years time, someone's going to do it. Fifty unbroken muscle. Up. Yeah, absolutely. Because five years ago, uh, I know Matt Fraser does thirty now. Yeah, people can do five. You know, five ring muscle ups was like, oh, that's that's pretty legit. If we would have this same conversation ten years ago and say a chick at the games would snatch hundred kilos and come third, we would laugh. Yep. You'd laugh at me, or I'd laugh at you. And it would be the same conversation. Yep. That's what I want to see. Yep. I'm excited to see the evolution me of too. that as a sport. And then as a gym and as a community, I'm excited to see what that does to our community. To say, hey, the guys at the top, top, top end, the pinnacle of this, are doing these crazy parameters. Why can't you do these small parameters? And those small parameters are now what we consider the elite level. And with correct progression and without risk reward, you know, making sure you're managing those parameters. If it's doable and feasible for that person, we can get someone from Joe Blow to half decent top 500 in the country for that specific sport. Yeah. And that is what we should be 100% providing to people if that's what they're coming for. Yeah. One thing that gives me a massive kick on the performance between the male and female is when it's all, if they go into an open water swim or a run together oh. and watch in you know, you might see a guy Girls come through. Dominate the boys. Uh, absolutely. Amazing. Sam you know? Briggs. Yeah. Tia. Tia. Yeah. On the run swim. Just annihilating. What, she come fourth overall or something? I can't remember. It was ridiculous. It was out of control. That, that's, I mean, that's the ability and the level at which they're at now is... Superior. The out superior. of this world. Out of this world, yeah. The female competition is superior to watch. Everyone is excited and ecstatic and got, got goosebumps thinking about it. Yeah. It's just... It's not that the men aren't great. It's not like I don't enjoy watching them. But right now, the sport has evolved to a place where they both are choosing the right athlete for the sport yep. and the right amount of females have chosen the right sport and the males are just a little bit, little bit behind. Yep. That'll do for today, I reckon. Yeah, buddy. I'm pretty pumped up. I'm going to train, maybe. It's supposed to be rest day, but... We've got the games day. Saturday. Next yeah. Day. In-house. 40 teams signed up. Uh, 20 teams signed up already. 40 yep. people. Go get those so next, sorted. Next, next Saturday. Saturday. 12 till 5 p.m. Then Soho DJ is going to be putting the party on. We're going to yep. have parties and pizzas after. Live music all day. Going to do a Mexican theme for our members. Yep. Mexican. Yep. Yep. And a um, bit of music. Bit of action. Heaps of fun. Heaps of fun. Yeah. All right, guys. Thanks for today, bud. Yeah, thanks, Paul. That was awesome. Going to do another one, eh, in a couple weeks? Yep. Maybe three weeks. Next one's coming. What I'd like to talk about is uh, the important stuff, less about nutrition, less about paleo, and more about the stuff that's actually going to get you to regionals and get you to the CrossFit Games, and we're talking about the real stuff, and we're talking about not some, so let's talk about the proper stuff, the old juicy juice. <laughs> <laughs> Pineapple juice, well, orange, orange juice. The live feed. Thanks, bud. No worries. Thanks for listening, guys. Thanks, guys.